Anyways, the talk today is about a concept that I didn't know before, I had to Google it. It's uh, comprehensive input. So, so from what I understand is, um, if you're able to understand something that you read, even though you don't understand all the words, well, you're still learning. And, but it, there's still a gap to get in because um, I, I guess when you don't know nothing, you don't know nothing. So, so <laughs> I'll leave you to, <laughs> so I'll leave you to it and uh, thank you. Working. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour. You know, uh, when you uh, go through security in Vancouver airport, you'll get somebody say maybe a recent immigrant from India saying, uh, good morning, bonjour. So uh, we're obligatory bilingual in Canada. I don't know what happens if you respond to that person in French. I haven't tried it yet, but here, uh, bilingual. So I, I said my bonjour, but uh, we'll continue in English. The uh, title of my talk was Making It Meaningful, but I'm not very well organized, so my first slide doesn't say that. My first slide <laughs> says comprehensible input, because CI comprehensible input is becoming more and more popular amongst teachers as a way to make the language class more meaningful for the learners. And I think we, as language learners, for us, language learning is meaningful. Most people at some level say, gee, I'd really like to speak Spanish, but they're not prepared to put the effort in, so to them it's not meaningful enough. And even as language learners, we're, I think, always trying to make sure that what we're doing is meaningful, and sometimes we have doubts, like maybe I'd rather be checking my Twitter feed than, you know, plowing my way through Arabic or something. So making things meaningful is important. And I think this uh, comprehensible input, or sometimes it's called compelling input, Stephen Krashen calls it, sometimes he calls it meaningful input, uh, and I'll move on to Stephen Krashen. You probably, I don't know if you can read the text there, but Stephen Krashen, to my mind, is, is, the, is the, he's the, uh, the Richard Dawkins of language learning. He very elegantly, very succinctly explains the process. And all of the things that he, did, he talks about, uh, the importance of, and I know we have some grammar fanatics in the audience here, but, and I have nothing against them because I, I agree to disagree with people, but sometimes. But it's the meaningful input, comprehensible input, and preferably compelling input that enables us to learn the language. And, um, I believe that uh, all of the sort of more deliberate language learning activities that we do and which we may find or may not find stimulating, pleasant or whatever are less important to us than simply imbibing input. And I look at language learning, uh, being Canadian, you know, we have certain cultural, you know, we can't kind of get beyond certain things that are kind of important to our lives. So hockey, excuse me. Language learning is like an upside down hockey stick. So when we start, we have this period, this is the blade of the hockey stick, I have a pointer, but you can see the blade of the hockey stick, and that's that initial period, which can be three months, it can be six months, where what begins as sort of just noise, the language, we just hear it, it's noise, we don't know where one, the next word begins, we don't have any words, we don't have anything, and there's this very steep climb and it is in some ways the most satisfactory period in our discovery of a new language because from knowing nothing, from being able to say nothing, we actually start to understand something. Look at me, I can read Arabic. I can't read it very well, I get the same letters wrong every time, but I am able to make some meaning of Arabic. And so that's a steep climb, but in some ways a satisfactory climb. And then you have this very, very, very long period, which one of the presenters here referred to as the desert, where it looks as if we aren't making any progress at all. And that's just the period where we just have to accumulate so many words, and it's just astounding how many words we need to be comfortable. We think we have a lot of words, and then we go and read a newspaper article or a book or with some people, and words are flying around, and we realize just we may, we think we're here, and in fact, we're sort of just past, you know, a third of the way. So that's the sort of the, the shaft of the hockey stick. 
So, and when we begin, of course, nothing is comprehensible. So that's, you can say that's an inherent contradiction in the theory of comprehensible input. You're actually gonna take something that's not comprehensible. And so how can you learn from comprehensible input when nothing is comprehensible? So I'm gonna share with you, and I think this is what we all do, and this is the thing in talking to a group like you, I'm not talking about things that you haven't experienced yourself. So when we get started, like all I try to do initially is to get used to the sounds. Like if I can get to the point where I identify that that's a sound and that's a, that's a word, that's a word, and that's a word, even though I don't know what the word is, then I feel good about myself. Because when I began, what was a word? It was just noise. And, and then as I pick out a few words, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. Once you've got a couple of words here and there, the slowly the picture starts to become clearer. So one word at a time, you start to differentiate sounds, and so it's becoming a little bit less incomprehensible. I believe in repetition. Uh, I trust my brain to eventually pick the language up, so I'm not frustrated. Uh, I know that in order for me to understand any explanation of grammar, I first have to have had that experience. So if the grammar explanation explains something that I have already experienced, okay, oh yeah, okay, I understand that. But if it tries to sort of anticipate what I'm gonna meet in the language, it's kind of meaningless for me. And the other, I think the other thing I think which we all do as language learners is that we are comfortable with uncertainty. So the fact that we don't understand it very well, the fact that we can't say what we want to say, uh, there's always that same spot in this text, I listen to it, I don't understand it, it doesn't bother us. Unfortunately, most people are much less tolerant of uncertainty and they get mad and frustrated. Mad and frustrated, not good. Chinese expression, you know. <laughs> so anyway. The other thing is, okay, making it meaningful, making it compelling, I do a lot of listening. Listening is about 70% of my language learning time. If for no other reason than it is very easy to organize. I just get in the car, you know, and nowadays the technology is such, USB, not USB, what do you call it, Bluetooth. I get in the car, I start, it up, start up my car and I'm listening to Farsi or Arabic or whatever. Sometimes I got the wrong language on or I don't, then I gotta somehow while driving change, you know, the, uh, what I'm listening to, which is not very safe. I don't recommend you do that. Sometimes I do pull over and change. Um, it's important that the voice be pleasing. And I think this is extremely important because you know, I find initially I have to listen many, many times and there is, there's no question that some people's voices are more pleasant to listen to than other people's voices. <laughs> and it can be subjective. So it's, a, it's very important to have material where you enjoy the voice, the sound is good. Another thing I find is that uh, it's easier to learn from subjects that are familiar. We're still in that blade area of the hockey stick here. So we're trying to get a, a, you know, a toehold in the language and therefore the more familiar the subject matter, the better. It's nice if the subject matter is interesting, but with all due respect to Krashen, in the first that you know, sh uh, blade of the hockey stick, it's hard to find stuff that is both interesting and at the same time comprehensible. So you are having to listen over and over again, at least that's my experience, to stuff that isn't tremendously interesting, but it's, it's, it's compelling in the sense that you want to make sense of it. So that in that initial period, your desire to understand how the language works and to discover words makes material that is inherently not so interesting, compelling. But even within that, I think it's important to choose. So if I find something that I just don't like, I don't like the voice, I find the subject is stupid, then I'll go on to something else, okay? I also believe that we needn't start learning languages at the beginning, because there is no beginning and end. There is no chapter one in the language. And uh, in fact, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, if you analyze the sort of dialogues you get in the Routledge or Teach Yourself or even Hippocrene or whatever, it's not really that we're only gonna do the present tense or we're only gonna have, you know, the absolute most frequent words. In fact, you end up in the beginning, excuse me, you end up in some level early intermediate type of material. So with that in mind, uh, you know, and also I, I'm not a big fan of the standard stuff you find in uh, language learning textbooks like the train station and the, the customs. I mean, like, if there's one place I'm not going to use the language that I've just learned, it's going through customs. All right? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. 
what I think is very uh, useful is to get at the most common verbs. If you can kind of get a handle on the most common verbs, uh, particularly when you go to speak, that's really useful. That's more useful than the, you know, learning the colors. I mean, the stuff they do in books is unbelievable. Teaching you all the colors, teaching you all the parts of the body, the different, you know, items of clothing, completely useless. But verbs, good. You go, come, need, take, give. All of these are very, very important to get a handle on early. And uh, what else we got here? So, yeah, don't be too ambitious. That's, I try not to be. Whatever I achieve, I'm happy. Uh, I'm trying to discover the language. I'm trying to get the rhythm of the language. I focus on a voice that I like. Am I going backwards here? Um, no, here we are. Okay. So, nowadays, we have tremendous internet resources. Okay? And for example, context reverso. I don't know who here uses it, but if I'm doing, okay, this happens to be in Arabic, but if I'm doing, say, French, I go to context reverso, I see the conjugation. So I was thinking about this, and I, I often think about things as they relate to language learning. So I have my, uh, you know, the, the schedule of speakers here and, and where they're speaking. And I don't know whether you've had the same experience, but I think I've looked at mine 15 times. You know, who's speaking when, where. And if I say, okay, I've looked at it 15 times now, who's speaking when this morning? I haven't a clue. Like I have already forgotten. I've looked at it 15 times. I don't remember who, whether it's 9 or 9.30 and who's speaking and in which room. Uh, and the same is true. I was thinking, you know, I take the subway here and I love the subway. I think it's great. And I've looked at the subway map I don't know how many times. But I still don't really have a clear picture of the subway map, no matter, you know, I've looked at, at it however many times. I think if I travel the same route every day, I would know the stations. But just looking at the subway map doesn't tell me what the stations are. And it's the same with looking at conjugation tables. You can look at conjugation tables, declension tables, try to study them. It doesn't, it's, it's part of the process. And so to that extent, it, we're very lucky. Now when we learn languages where there are issues like conjugation tables, every time we come across it, we look it up, scan it, it's exposure, I don't try to master it, I go back into the text that I'm reading. And so we have these online dictionaries, conjugating dictionaries, grammar lookup. I can look up any point of grammar anytime. You know, Ukrainian adjectives, bingo, lots. So, uh, or, or even on more, in more Farsi verbs, we look it up, there you have them. So, tremendous internet resources. So, as an example, okay, so here's my activity in Farsi. I started Arabic about six months ago. Major goal was to be able to read. Uh, I'm very disappointed to find out that very few people speak the form of Arabic that I'm learning, which is standard Arabic. So therefore, I said, okay, well, I'll take advantage of the fact that I can start to read, so I'm going to start into Farsi. But you can see there that in Farsi, and we have these uh, mini stories at link. I mean, I have listened a lot, okay, a lot. So I, I can't read it because I don't have my glasses on, but I think it probably shows 20 or 30 times each one of these stories. So I tend to ge get into a lot of repetition. I listen whenever I can. And the goal of my other activities, like my reading, is to make my listening activity more effective. Because if I'm listening and I don't understand, that's less effective. If I listen and I understand more and more, and each time I listen, I, I, I notice more and more things, then that's very effective. So I go back in and read, look things up, forget them, look them up again, all of this so that when I'm sitting in my car, because that's, you know, I'm in the car 30, 40 minutes a day, I do the dishes, breakfast and dinner, uh, work out half an hour a day, that's an hour and a half of listening time. So that the whole strategy is to make that time as powerful as it can be. So again, uh, you know, you can't start with authentic content, so graded material is good. Uh, Ole Richards has some graded ebooks, he's not, or at least graded books, and he's also developing some conversations, which are great. I think conversations with transcript, always with transcript. I never listen to anything without transcript until I'm well past, sort of well along on the hockey stick. Um, lots of repetition, whatever, okay. Arabic, it's the same thing. I mean, I've listened to these stories, gosh, I can't even, again, I can't see it, but many, many times. And so, and, and one of the problems that we have as language learners is jumping from the sort of beginner material that I'm listening to many, many times to something that is more interesting. So I was able to get, I have 
actually added a lot of the content that we have at Link myself. So I go on Upwork, I say I want someone, Arabic speaker, to do A, B, C, D. This particular fellow is an Egyptian who has a blog on biographies of famous uh, Islamic scholars. So I said, can you record that for us? So he said, yes. And every time I try to do it, of course, it's too difficult. So I, I retreat. I go in there, I try something that's difficult, and uh, it's just too tough. So I go back to the simple stuff. I'm kind of looking for something that's kind of in between. Haven't found it yet. So I did the same with my Greek. And again, a lot of people like uh, the, the Little Prince, and that's available typically in a lot of languages because it's been translated into so many languages, but I didn't like the Little Prince. I don't, that's just... <laughs> I'm not into those kind of stories, it certainly does nothing for me. And so I found a podcast in Greek uh, about the building of the Parthenon, absolutely fascinating, stone by stone, and uh, just phenomenal quality sound, everything about it, you know, interviewing people in the streets of Athens, the whole works. And so then I went and found someone to transcribe it for me, and then I was able to study it, because just by listening I couldn't understand it. So, Again, we get back to this business about making it meaningful. There's so many different ways that we have to make it meaningful. We have to, A, get a transcript, transcript to make it meaningful. We have to find stuff that interests us to make it meaningful. And I, I wish, in effect, that uh, us language learners, we should almost pool uh, our resources of what we know about what resources are out there or even you know, create more content in our various languages if people would just talk to their friends and transcribe them and if you could have some kind of a common site and people could go there. Because I think those kinds of casual conversations would be very useful as to, to, to get that sort of material between what you can buy, an e-book, audio, but you can buy that, but it's too difficult. My my, like my friend, the, the, the Egyptian with his blog, it's just too difficult for me. But if I had some simple conversations that were transcribed in Arabic, that would really be helpful except that no one speaks the Arabic that I'm learning, but that's another <laughs> subject. <laughs> and what else we got? Yeah, so I tend to, on my computer, I've got for all the different languages, I store, uh, you know, whatever I find. So I got a whole bunch, like this just happens to be Polish, and so that when I feel like going back to Polish, I go there and I got a whole bunch, because very often you find some resources, you use them, you forget about them. So I make sure that I catalog them. I just wonder if we all shared the material that we have cataloged in the different languages, plus created some of our own, maybe working with polyglot groups elsewhere, we could generate a lot of uh, useful resources. Now, getting back to the desert, I just thought this idea of your, when you're on that long shaft of the hockey stick, that that was a pretty uh, uninspiring uh, sort of image. So I see it rather as cross-country skiing. So if you go cross-country skiing, that initial, you might have to have, there might be an initial climb, which would be the, the blade of the hockey stick, but then when you're on that, that shaft, you, you know, you may have a long way to go, but actually it's quite pleasant. Like, when I go cross-country skiing, it's not with the intention of finishing early. Like, that's not why I'm there. <laughs> I'm there because I actually enjoy gliding along in the forest. So if I'm gliding here in my Arabic forest, I may, might take a little detour to Farsi, uh, find out that the snow is too deep and I don't like it, and then I come back to the main path. Uh, but I'm always refreshed when I come back, and this is also true. Uh, did some Farsi, go back to Arabic, I'm refreshed. I'm, I find that, you know, we need both repetition, but we also need uh, novelty, we need new. And after a while of, of, of sort of beating my head against a brick wall with Arabic, and I go off into the Farsi, uh, which is in some ways easier, uh, but then when I come back to Arabic, Arabic seems fresh again. But it still is a long way, and we keep on going, and, and the, uh, the, voy the trip is, is the goal, is the reward. Uh, that's, if I go cross-country skiing, it's because I want to ski. And uh, if I learn languages, it's because I enjoy being in those languages. And I'm always reluctant to leave a language to go into another language. And so the journey is the goal. And we just, so all the, however many words you're learning, you just keep on going. And there is no language that I speak that I didn't wish I spoke better. So there is no way you're gonna achieve mastery of any language. Uh, and uh, I'm always happy to go back to another one, and yet I'm tempted to go and explore. I'm not quite at the Moses McCormick level where he's up to 60 languages, but I do enjoy discovering and exploring 
new languages. So that's it, and I look forward to your question. Thank you very much, Steve. So we have plenty of time for questions, so you have the superstar here, it's time. All right. Okay. Oh, we can start here. Thank you. Um, you said that we need novelty and new to kind of stay motivated in our languages, but the example that you gave was looking at a new language and then returning to an old language. But what if you don't want to necessarily look at a new language? What would you suggest in that case to kind of get that novelty? Well, the, first of all, it's, it's a man called Manfred Spitzer who wrote a book called Learning in the Brain. And, and he know, he's like, I don't know anything about cognitive science or anything, but he says that the brain requires novelty and repetition. So obviously we need repetition to fire the neurons and all of that stuff, but the brain starts to get tired of that after a while. The brain needs something fresh, some fresh stimulus. So you don't have to go to another language to create novelty. There's many different ways. For example, if you, if, you know, I've listened to some lessons 30 or 40 times. That's an awful lot of repetition. That's not very much novelty. So I can go to other, that's why I, uh, you know, perfect example is, uh, Often I recommend, and I think many people do this, uh, if you're starting in a language and if you're using language books, then take an Asimil and a Routledge and a Teach Yourself. And so do the same material using different uh, approaches. Uh, or uh, very, go and, and challenge yourself with some more difficult material, then go back to easy material. So whatever you can do, vary what you're doing, vary the difficulty level, the subject matter. It, the brain does need this. And for that matter, take a break. And, uh, and I, I find that um, you, you never lose what you've learned. It's there somewhere. And very often when you come back to the language you were learning, you're better for some strange reason. So y there's different ways to create that novelty. Uh, Steve, one of the things I love about your talks is that you talk about like sort of like the long-term uh, attitude toward learning languages, because when you do it for decades and decades, you have to find a way not to burn out. And one of the challenges that I find is that when you start accumulating languages, to avoid sort of having the guilt like, oh my god, I haven't done Polish in, 30 month, uh, in three months, I've got to get back to it. And uh, I, what, uh, Many times I've been at a job interview or something, and they said to me, well, how do you maintain all your languages? And I said, well, I'm not married to them, they're not people. If, if I don't call them for a year, they don't get offended. So I just wanted to, you to share with us a little bit, how do you approach, you know, when you've learned a lot of different languages and you're coming in and out and whether you ever feel guilty if you abandon one or sort of what your philosophy for maintaining and dealing with all the different languages is? Well, you have to be realistic, okay? So, uh, a perfect example, um, when I, I studied Ukrainian for quite a while, I was in Lviv, Ukraine. I was doing great. I was very proud of myself, you know. And I have no difficulty listening to audiobooks in Ukrainian and reading about Ukrainian history. And I was here at our get together in that, whatever it's called there, uh, on, on Salon, wherever we have our first get together. And so one of our group here who speaks Ukrainian, she started at me in Ukrainian. I couldn't find a word. <laughs> Partly because I had been looking at Slovak or something. So th there are certain languages that suppress other languages. You can't feel badly. Like, I have 10 languages that I can produce. I have other languages where, with a little effort, maybe half an hour, maybe not more than half an hour. Other languages, it might be a day. But I know that there is a potential there that I have invested in, that's there, it's not going away. And if I ever end up in that country, like I was in Crete speaking Greek, I, now I would be totally tongue-tied, try to say something in Greek. I'm not here to perform, I'm not here to prove. If you want to say, okay, then you don't speak Greek, okay I, don't, okay, I don't speak Greek, but I know that if I go back to Greece, it'll come back. So I just think whatever we, ha whatever we do in, in a language, it's, it's in the bank. It's not going anywhere. And when you go back to it, you may feel that you've slipped a bit, but it'll very quickly come back to where you were and, and in fact, be better. Just to digress a bit, there's a fellow from the University of UCLA, Robert Bjork, and he has done a number of videos about interleaving and it, where you learn something and forget it and learn it again and forget it and do something else, and th that's actually better for the brain. You are going to retain those things better, learning and forgetting. So it doesn't bother me at all. I don't feel guilty. 
Many things I feel guilty about, but not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'll be a more limited group, actually. Hey, Steve. Um, I'm the leader of the Gala Rebellion and represent and uh, Woo! rebellion. Sorry. And no, uh, who rebellion, by the way? Sorry? Which rebellion? The, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and at the strong rebellion yesterday, 15 strong, um, we were having a discussion about leaving languages temporarily. Um, somebody in our group had left German for 18 years and he felt that, his, okay, sorry. Um, he had felt that his German actually had gotten worse. Um, and the point was brought up that maybe when you leave a language for a short period of time, when you come back to it, it's just the satisfaction of learning it again that gives your brain the feeling that it's better, but it might actually be worse than what it was. And I was just wondering if you'd considered that little mind trick. Um, you know, 18 years is a long time. It, <laughs> it, it depends. It depends on how strong your hold on the language is. Like I, yeah, if you leave even the languages that I'm very good at, say Japanese, French, if I left them for 18 years, it, it would take me longer. Like it's gonna take you longer to get it back. However, when I started into Japanese, I knew zero Japanese. So when I go back into Japanese, I won't be starting at zero, right? So I'll be starting at something better than zero. Uh, for example, if I listened, I was just listening to Greek in my car in Vancouver, and there were words there that I used to know that I now don't know. Uh, but is that discouraging? No, because if I were to apply myself to Greek, like when I consider all the effort that I put into Greek to get it to that level, and now it's slipped back, you know, to get it back there is not gonna take that much time. But I wouldn't wanna leave it for 18 years. I think that's a bit excessive. So, and, and, and so far as your question of whether that's an impression or not, I'll give you an example. I uh, was going off to Sweden, so, and I had been listening to these Chinese uh, stories. I have this Chinese storyteller who takes, as it tells the romance of the three kingdoms in Chinese. It's tremendous, much better than any video and difficult to understand. And so then, but I'm going off to Sweden, so I've been listening to Swedish audiobooks and reading about Swedish history and stuff. And then I go off to Sweden, then I come back, I put on my Chinese CDs, I understand them better. Absolutely, and I've had other people confirm that experience. Uh, so I think what happens there is that, that uh, not 18 years, I'm not talking about 18 years, but, but I think this idea of, of stimulating the brain with something else, refreshing it a little bit, uh, it makes you more, uh, uh, you know, your ability to notice, to observe, to realize what's happening, the sounds, the words, it actually picks up. And, and I feel that the more languages you learn, in fact, you get better at noticing. You hear better, you hear sounds better. And, and so to that extent, that little mix, mix of, say, Chinese and Swedish had that kind of a beneficial effect. But leaving languages for 18 years, not, I wouldn't recommend that as a strategy necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it longer to learn a language. <laughs> uh, so I didn't speak German for 18 years. <laughs> so someone stole my question, so I'm gonna have to uh, come up with a new one. Um, I, I mean, I, like, I noticed that um, there are certain, like, really rare words that just, like, just pop into my mind automatically, but some of the basic ones are just completely gone, that words I should know and I, and I don't. It's like I can't reach for them anymore. But I guess, I guess my question is, is um, oh, no, I forgot my question. <laughs> so so if, you ha if you were in the case where you did have, a, like, a, that long of a gap, what kind of recommendations would you, would you suggest on trying to recover that lost time, I guess. Uh, well, that. first of all, uh, you know, it's not obvious that the most, you know, basic words are easier to remember than somewhat, you know, specific words. Like, to me, that's not obvious at all. In fact, you can easily forget some of the most basic words. Uh, I, I, my approach is always the same. You know, it's listening and it's a very heavy emphasis on listening and reading. So you would pick up your, Jap your German after 18 years. You wouldn't be starting at zero. So you're not starting where everything is totally incomprehensible. Uh, you're starting where some things you actually recognize, some things are kind of hidden, but they're actually there. So you just go back in and listen and read and review your words, and you might want to flip through a little grammar book, uh, not with the intention of remembering anything. And you just, it's the same process. 
except it'll be much faster for you than it was the first time through. I hope you don't mind if I ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> I've been very silent. So I wanted to know, um, well, when you, when you know 10 languages and more, uh, how do you make sure that you don't mix them up all the time? You know, uh, yeah, I speak f three and a half and I already mix them up all the yeah. time, so. <laughs> you know, you can't make sure that you're not gonna mix them up. You are gonna mix them up. You're gonna mix them up, uh, sometimes you're conscious of mixing them up, sometimes you're not conscious of mixing them up. Uh, if we realize that the goal is to communicate, and if you're speaking, say, Spanish, and you're throwing in some Italian or vice versa, yeah, so what? You know, if I'm speaking Russian and I throw in a Ukrainian word or whatever, uh, it, as long as the whole goal is to communicate. What tends to happen is that the more time, you, if you then spend more time in that, you, that environment of just that language, you'll mix up fewer and fewer words. To me, it's, it's not a major issue. And if you say something that they don't understand, they'll ask you. they say, sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, when I'm speaking, I'm not there to demonstrate that I can speak language X without making a mistake, without, you know, mixing words. It's, that's not the issue. I'm there communicating, hoping to understand what that person is saying and hoping that that person understands what I'm saying. And I know that that whole process is going to improve my skill in the language with mistakes, with words mixed in. It's, to me, it's not a big issue. Steve, it's been really nice to see you in your entirety um, because the first time I ever saw you was in 2014 as a giant disembodied head on the screen of the, at the screen at the polyglot gathering in Berlin. Um, so that's a pleasure. Um, it's so, it's, it's funny for me to hear you talk about language because, and this is not a huge surprise to me, there are quite a few differences between the things you like the most and the things I like the most about language. And it, I, I've enjoyed that aspect of the language learning community that you see these differences and you benefit from them because sometimes they push you to do things more that you know I know I should do but I just don't really want to. Like let me begin with, let me give you an example. So you know when you said that you disparage, those disparaging words about colors and body parts? So for me automatically I'm like, I love learning colors and learning body parts. That's titillating. And then grammar, there, then there's grammar too, which for me is so, I have a grammar fetish. I just have a grammar fetish. And so if you have a fetish for something, it's inherently interesting. But I think for me, a lot of when I, when I um, am studying a language, just my personality, uh, I feel like, I'm managing my weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses is that I don't actually deal well with frustration. So when I have a lot of input reading or listening and I'm not understanding it, I get frustrated very quickly. I can remember that all the way back to my Spanish classes in fourth and fifth, fifth grade is that that's an issue. So I think I like to build very slowly in little blocks from the bottom and just get to the point where I have less uncertainty when I encounter the reading and listening situations. But so I, I don't really have a, a question for you, but just a comment that I appreciate um, the limitations of my approach sometimes. And it's nice to be encouraged in different directions and to see you in your entirety. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, you know, I, I recognize that uh, people have different uh, points of view. Uh, I, in fact, brought my MAGA hat here. Where is it? <laughs> but um, I find it frustrating to pour over tables. Uh, it, it began with German and to try and remember, and I can't remember them. Uh, I don't find it frustrating to read as long as I have access to certain tools. So if I have access to, here's a little story, uh, again in our many stories, the vocabulary repeats. I can listen to the audio of the thing, I can save it to a playlist to listen to later on, I can look up each word, I can save phrases to review later. All of these, this so makes it uh, much less fr frustrating. If I were to try to read, when I do try to read Arabic from a book, I quickly give up. I, I, I sometimes say, oh, I've improved now, I'll grab a book. But when I'm, as I said, with a book, I can't press on anything, I can't look up words, it's, that's totally frustrating. So a, as long as I have this environment on my iPad, it's, to me, it's, it's extremely pleasant. But to each his own, and uh, you know, yeah, body parts, whatever, you know. <laughs> Hi, 
Um, so I was interested to hear uh, about your focus on uh, listening and listening comprehension. And yep. I find that that's something that I'm frequently weakest at. Um, so anyway, I'm very weak at listening comprehension <laughs> frequently. And um, I was wondering about, so if you're studying a kind of understudied language where there's not a lot of resources available, I've heard some conflicting um, statements about what you should do in order to improve your listening comprehension. And it varies from just as much input as possible to even sitting and like trying to transcribe, uh, which I've attempted to do in the past. So, but. I found that that's kind of intensive and you can burn out if you're just sitting there listening to something over and over again and attempting to write down every word they say. So um, what would you suggest really if, you're, if that's your focus? Um, how intensive and how sort of conscious should you be when you're trying to get better at listening comprehension? Well, you know, listening over and over again to stuff that you don't understand is not something that I like doing. <laughs> I don't think that's very effective in terms of learning. So I like to always have a transcript because once I have a trans transcript of digital format, all kinds of tools are now available to me. And so then I can look up words and I can read it again and then I go away and I listen and I there's still the same parts that I don't understand. And so there's this process in the initial period of your sort of mining this material for words and phrases and reviewing the words and phrases and listening to it again. Now, where there's not a lot of material available, now, what I have the ability or the means or whatever to do is I'll find someone on Upwork who will transcribe. So, and very often I'm learning languages where the local, you know, cost, labor cost is not that high, so it's not prohibitive to do that. Now, I don't know what languages you are learning, but in my case, I had a lot of stuff created for me or transcribed for me in Romanian, in Arabic, Greek, even in Korean, I found someone who was willing to do that for a reasonable, amount of money. So I always want to have the transcript. I don't want to be constantly listening to something where I haven't got a hope of understanding what's being said, in, in the hope that somehow magically these pennies are going to drop. They don't. I have to get back to the transcript. Hi, Steve. Um, so you mentioned that at the beginning you tend to listen to the same audio clips many, many, many times. 20, 30 times. Um, do you find it useful to do, do you only do that with spoken words or do you find it useful to do that with songs, music as well? You know, I think uh, it's important to do that with things that you like. I personally prefer doing that with text. I, uh, I am very, songs, I have this sense that it's gonna be love and you know, you know <laughs> body parts and whatever. <laughs> you know, it kind of gets boring after a while, but uh, I like the idea, I like our mini stories because the verbs, the common words, take, give, go, need, have, want, repeat so often. And also when you listen to something 30, 40 times, and I would think the music would be a distraction, uh, it gives you momentum when you go to read it, you've heard it, you've got phrases that you can say, it's just, it's, it's something, it's almost hypnotic. I find the, the sort of repetitive listening to these things is quite compelling and, and it, it, it in fact, I gave, I gave an example. I, uh, well, I don't know if Benny's in the room, but just to annoy Benny, <laughs> I, uh, put up, I put up a video where I said, you know, speaks, Steve speaks from day one kind of thing. Normally, I like to wait until I have five, 10,000 words, the way we count them, I think, before I will talk to anyone. And in fact, with Russian, I waited at least a year and a year and a half before I spoke to anyone, just building up my comprehension and my vocabulary. But now with Farsi, after 350 words, I had a conversation. And I was able to do that because I had listened to th these stories like 30, 40, 50 times. So within the limit of these stories, I could actually have a back and forth. The goal is not that I think I'm gonna learn. It tends to make me more acute, getting back to the, the listening comprehension. I, I now hear better. After having had that interchange, I now then I, when, I, when I listen to those stories, I hear them better. But the music to me would be a distraction but to each his own or her own. Uh, hi, Steve. Um, the different facets of uh, language, right? There's obviously uh, listening comprehension, uh, reading, writing, speaking. Uh, do you find that there's any particular uh, useful order or priority uh, in, you know, in the languages that you learn or is it maybe the case that it's horses for courses, whereas, you know, for instance, we talked about 
Chinese maybe, you know, especially with technology today, you probably don't need as much emphasis nowadays on writing because you can do that all, you know, you can forget how to write pretty much easily now and still be able to be very good at communicating and reading and understanding the characters uh, still. Um, but in terms of overall in those different facets, do you have a certain technique or like I said, is it horses for courses where different languages you may place different priorities on, on those different a aspects of language learning? Well, uh, it depends on your goals, but uh, I think that listening and reading, listening comprehension and reading are the two that I start with. That's my major emphasis. Uh, I tend not to write by hand in any of the languages that I speak. It just doesn't happen. I rarely have to write anything out by hand. When I studied Chinese, I could write my three, 4,000 characters out by hand, but I couldn't do that now, no way. I can use, though, I can write using the computer in Japanese, in Chinese, in Russian, whatever. If I had to try and write by hand, and if I've never tried it, I have no idea what it'd be like. I can't even read handwritten Russian because they, you know, <laughs> different, different letters start looking different than what they're doing to me, you know? So, uh, but if you want to learn, like when I learned Chinese characters, I had to write them. Now, that was 50 years ago. They didn't have HiSIC or they didn't have all the other tools that are available. So nowadays, people learning characters may have different ways of doing it, but I had to write them out many, many, many times. And I think that motor thing of writing out the characters probably helped me to learn them. But uh, it depends on your goals. If you're working for someone in Germany and you're going to write letters in German, you've got to write and you have to write grammatically correctly. And so that's one circumstance. If you're learning a language out of interest, then you do whatever you want. But I still, you know, it gets back to me of listening, <laughs> comprehension, and reading, building you up to speaking. And then when you start speaking, whenever you want to, it doesn't really matter to me, that's going to, again, improve your listening comprehension and your reading ability. And so that's a very, it's sort of a virtuous circle. And writing to me, uh, when I write in a foreign language, I write the way I speak. So I try not to be too slangy when I speak because it's very dangerous to try to be slangy in a foreign language. You don't know how you sound using these terms. And so I just have a neutral form of the language when I speak. And then I, when I write, I use more or less the same on my computer so I don't have to know how to write by hand. Hello, Steve. Hi. Um, so in my tight-knit foreign ling language department in Floyd County, Virginia. There's three of us, three teachers in the whole county. Um, we've fully embraced the whole CI method, comprehensible input, but what we've been trying to do as of late is a move towards non-targeted comprehensible input. So traditionally you have targets and you're like, yeah, today we're gonna say this, here's your language target, like uh, bonjour, ça va? And you'll cycle, circle through that probably 50, 60 times, 70, who knows how many times a class period. But what it is now is, going back to this idea of compelling input, is if you are telling a story, it doesn't have to be targeted if the students, especially in the context of a traditional public high school, if the students are creating the characters, if the students are kind of driving the story. I was just curious, because sometimes, you know, the, I have the students create the stories, right? They'll spend a whole class period drawing, making characters, and sometimes you get characters like a, uh, last week there was a gangsta chicken. <laughs> uh, gangsta rooster was his name. And um, the stories end up being hilarious sometimes, and sometimes sad, so again, compelling, not necessarily funny, but just interesting for the students. Um, but what, what a lot of people ask me is, um, you know, uh, I guess it seems kind of weird if you've got a chicken with a flamethrower that's actually not a flamethrower, but is a water gun, and uh, the blue mass that's coming out of it isn't actually a f water, it's a flame. Um, do you see the value in providing input in that way? Uh, I guess is what I'm getting at when you, when you are not targeted. Well, meaningful input it's, it's got to be meaningful to those people who are involved. So those people who are involved in that story, they will find that meaningful. I don't believe it's useful to sort of target certain expressions. Getting back to my disagreement with Alan here. Today we will learn how to greet people in French. You're not going to learn it today. You may cover it today. You may expose them to it today. You might test them on it today. Doesn't mean that, you've, that they've learned it today. Today we're going to learn the parts of the body. We're going to learn the colors. Doesn't mean you're going to learn it. 
I think we, we pick these things up by being exposed to meaningful content, and that meaningful content depends on the context. Uh, but our, I, I certainly, in my own case, my ability to try and target something and learn it is very limited. I went to Vietnam, so I bought, typically went and bought some books on Vietnamese, listened to a bunch of Vietnamese, looked, I had my phrase book and stuff, and I spent six or seven days in Vietnam. I was able to use one word. <laughs> that was it. That's all I retained from all of that because it's simply not enough time. And the only reason I can remember come on, because it sounds like come on, and that's thank you in Vietnamese. It's the only one. So learning stuff, targeting, we're going to learn this today, I don't believe it happens. So that's why comprehensible input and or meaningful in that context in, you know, your whatever fl flame-throwing chicken is meaningful to the kids in your class, so it's good. Uh, you recently, you talked about your trip to Sweden. Yes. And Swedish has a very particular rhythm to it. Right. I was wondering how you found uh, learning that particular rhythm as well as other rhythms of other languages. How has that been for you in terms of your studies? Yet the sword, they can say. They didn't think of that last. Intonation in Swedish is difficult, but I don't make any deliberate attempt to practice it. You just hope that with enough exposure, if you're with them, you kind of pick up on their on their rhythm if you're open to it. Uh, but you know, you're identifiable as uh, as <laughs> not a local. Yeah, it's a bit difficult. It's easier to do the more the monotone. Even Chinese tones are easier in a way, I find, than the, the getting that. Because the danger is you're going to try to exaggerate it and you'll sound silly. So it's hard. Right. So it all depends on the language. Obviously, for someone who has learned, say, a Slavic language, uh, and then I want to go and do Polish, I can go to very difficult material fairly quickly, especially using link. I can look words up, and the whole thing makes sense, right? Um, Arabic, not so. Uh, I am not, personally, I don't like children's books. So again, meaningful to whom? Some people like children's books. I like, uh, uh, you know, one thing that I find, you know, if you're going from sort of Beginner material to challenging material, some of the things that I think are very good along the way are, for example, transcribed conversations. Because in, in uh, conversations, people tend to use a higher percentage of high frequency words. So, you know, literature is the worst. So if you're in literature or some technical manual, it may only be 70% high frequency words. Conversation might be 90% high frequency words. Plus, it's very natural, it's very engaging. So, I wish, it, like, if we had conversations, uh, a website where everybody put up conversations in different languages that were transcribed, that would be great. Uh, I also find that uh, anything that is written in another language and translated is easier. So, if you can, Harry Potter, great, because if Harry Potter translated into whatever language is going to be easier than reading something in Japanese. But trans Harry Potter in Japanese is going to be easier. So those things are easier. I personally prefer nonfiction. I can get into a history book fairly early, partly because I'm interested in history and partly because there again, you very quickly get used to the vocabulary that they, that they use, whereas if you're into literature and they're descri de describing some beautiful scenery or whatever, it, you know, different trees and birds and stuff, it's uh, very difficult. <laughs> so, you know, there's different ways that you can make it graded. And, and the need for graded material varies depending on the language. And I'm not familiar with material, uh, you know, developed for people with reading disabilities. I have not, uh, I don't know anything about that. All right, thank you so much, Steve. Yes, 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 yes. That was quite enjoyable.